I want to welcome everyone back to the Pete Quinone show here with Thomas. How you doing, Thomas? I'm doing well, man. What I wanted to emphasize today, I assume people are getting something out of this. Um, I'm not being obtuse. I mean, I the Bader Meinhof phenomenon. You, you've got to understand. There's two things that I think are key to understanding it. Okay. First is that there, was, there truly were three iterations of it. This armed grouping that had a common lineage existed from 1970 to 1998. And every five to seven years, because their operators got, got, got killed, ended up incarcerated or disappeared underground, some of whom didn't like reemerge for decades despite being, you know, hunted by by um by the Bundes Republic, you know, counter terrorist police and um and the off what they what they euphemistically call the Office of the Protection of the Constitution, which is no joke. These people have limitless resources. But um, you know, the original Bader Meinhof um grouping they really were they really were a product of a peculiar time and place and that was adenauer's bundes republic and their parentage um a lot of these guys fathers had died in the war or just never come home you know there was like lost generation of people as we'll see because we're going to get into their biographies and they had kind of a confused understanding of what they wanted to do. Like Horst Mahler, I maintain, was always something of an ideological pole star for the group. And um, I believe he was always a national socialist. He was different than the rest of them, and he wasn't a direct action operator. However, by the last iteration of the Rote Army fraction, they were totally indexed with the Stasi. And they were basic, they were running operations for the DDR. You know, like it had totally changed into something different. You know, um, and it had become solidly in the Stalinist Warsaw Pact camp. You know, um, which was a huge coup for Marcus Wolf and the Minister for Start Security to be able to do that. In America, you know, the Soviets, true, after, after the common turn, was, would, like, cease to exist formally. Okay. Um, what replaced it was this aggregation above ground, you know, it was common form, which was basically uh, kind of like the communist version of the G7, you know, or the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, maybe is more a correct analogy, but, you know, the... Um, the, the Communist Party, the Soviet Union, um, they had their tentacles in many things. And they were constantly trying to flip leftists in the UK and America like to the Warsaw Pact camp, like away from this schismatic post-68 um, ideology. You know, and um, they had some success with that in the UK, but in America, like it was always hitting the wall. You know, like Gus Hall... Um, I mean, it's an interesting, there were some guys on the right, especially in the earlier phase of the Cold War, um, like James Hartung Mattel, who I believe were signaling to some of these Warsaw Pact type uh, agents in America. Their notion being this is similar to what Goebbels' notion of clicking up with the KPD, you know, during like the years of struggle to smash the social Democrats, you know, um, there is an internal logic there, but, um, my point is, uh, you know, the, uh, the Stasi managed to basically totally and completely flip the, the Bader mine off tendency, you know, and make it literally like an organ of, uh, of, uh, the DDR, uh, violence apparatus. And I find that fascinating. So I wanted to get into the first iteration, the first iteration, the literal Bader-Meinhof 
faction um, and talk a bit about these personalities that constituted it and what their backgrounds were, because I think that is essentially is essential understanding the German situation and it's essential understanding why these people did what they did. I make the point again and again, you know, zeitgeist is very real. That, that's not just some conceptual prejudice I have. Like what is possible in, you know, the political realm is its own sphere of activity. Okay. And if you're talking about radical partisan action, like what is going to have resonance, what is going to index with the culture and the historical moment as it then exists is uh, is very historically contingent. You know, um, German young people who wanted to strike out at um, regime authority, really the only way they could conform that tendency was some sort of communism, okay? Um, Germany had literally, literally been annihilated and was partitioned and under hostile occupation to, to prevent a fascist going tendency from ever reemerging, you know? Um, and even those that were emergent, obviously, early on, were were uh were, were entirely adjacent to Soviet Union, you know, not in terms of their deep values or anything, but in terms of you know geostrategic realities as well as you know certain ideological um, interdependencies that were just essential in a in a in a bipolar world with a Soviet superpower as um the uh as 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 the as the lesser enemy of Europe than the true foe of Europe, which was um America. So I want to get into that a bit. Um the uh the the the, the Road Army faction came into existence in May nineteen seventy. Um and it was when uh there's an Andres Bader was sprung from prison. Bader had been locked up in 1968. Him and his uh, a girlfriend of his at the time, um, he set fire uh, to this department store, you know, to, to 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 strike back at capitalism, you know. And he said that he did it um, because the Bundesrepublik Republic there's an apathy about what was happening in Vietnam, you know. And um, it's interesting that at first these guys and ladies were taking their cues very much from kind of like the American radical left. And that's why like NAM was kind of their conceptual focus. That changed very much. And um, the uh, Palestine very much became their, like the Schwerpunkt in their view of of revolutionary activity abroad and kind of like the key battleground against um you know uh the uh the capitalist uh um global structure which uh i think reading between the lines it's pretty clear why that is okay um but in any event you know as of 1968 um Bader was, was still very, 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 very much kind of a, a rebel without a cause. You know, um, he drew a custodial sentence because Germany was very, very draconian in these days. You know, um, and um, Adenauer, who was kind of hated by both the right and the left, but he was, in purely objective terms, he was a pretty remarkable executive. You know, and he, he managed to kind of insinuate himself as all things to all people, you know, outside of the outside of the the national socialist right, what remained of it, and 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 the you know the far left. But he he realized a certain kind of conformity had to be imposed. You know, Germany was very much rearming and reconstituting to fight World War Three. And Adenauer made it clear that, you know, nuclear arms were going to be based in Germany, 
the Bundeswehr was going to participate in their deployment and use when War Day came. This was incredibly controversial for all kinds of reasons. You know, some prosaic, some rather complicated. But um, in any event, that's the context. So young Andrea's Bader at this point, I believe, was just kind of acting out to act out. Okay. Um, a lot of young people get it now, even those who are of rather gifted intelligence. It, it's um, you, you have to you have to live life just like literally just in terms of duration to get a true perspective on the historical situation. Um, interestingly, while he was incarcerated, obviously, I say May 14, 1970 is the day when kind of the the Rote Army fraction came into existence. That's when he was sprung out of prison. Okay. Um, now, for whatever reason, and we'll get into Bader's like background in a minute, like his upbringing. He was an incredibly contentious, violent person. He wasn't traditionally charismatic, but uh, people apparently would 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 gravitate to him and and treat him as a natural leader. Okay, um, he uh, it within his orbit was very much a a coterie of young outsiders, as it were. All right. Um, and um, despite his kind of like his nature went beyond cantankerous, he was like a violent person. You know, he if people disagreed with him, he would attack them like physically. They became his ops. You know, like um, and some degree of that like has to live in kind of like the heart and mind of every partisan. But in his case, it was it was truly extreme. Um, it. Uh, The primary architect of springing him out of prison was uh, Ulrika Meinhof, who was his sometime girlfriend, but more of kind of an more kind of an ideological fellow traveler. One thing that was unusual about the Bader Meinhof grouping, they always had women with them. Now, at first, it was probably, I mean, not to be crass about it, but they were, you know, because they were young and horny and, like, young guys want women around and vice versa. You know, young women gravitate towards guys in their age grouping. But there was a, there was an odd ideological dimension to it, too. Like, when I say an odd ideological dimension, I mean, it was shaped by the conditions of, of the immediate post-war years. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't dummy feminism. And dummy feminists don't like lock and load and 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 start knocking over banks and and springing and springing their people out of prison and 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 shooting cops. Okay, obviously, you know um, this caused some odd challenges for them later, especially as they came to index with Islamic resistance fighters. Obviously. Not because it's like Muslims have no problem training women to fight, and they do, but they can't have men and women cohabitating and sleeping in common quarters, and they can't have women in men's barracks and vice versa. We'll get into that later. But um, the one of the reasons in America, at least, the Royal Army faction, I think this kind of fascination developed around them is because there was like these good-looking like European broads always like clicked up with them, you know, and um. Kind of like the Patty Hearst thing, you know, like it, people like really like, like Americans are always like really fascinated by like women handling weapons. I mean, it was like literally like a quasi like pornographic genre of like of like half naked girls like like ripping rounds through, you know, like like assault weapons. You know, like it, like like it's a thing, you know, um, and it's I'm not I'm not being some like corny academic to say it's like obviously like very sexual, you know, like it's this, this should be clear to anybody. But, um, you know, um, Andres Bader, he gets sprung um, from this high security prison 
um, you know, by um, by um, you know, a masked man and these two young women, um, you know, and um, as uh, the police opened fire on um, on Andre's body, he leaped out a window, like literally. You know, like it's um, it's um, and um, you know they uh, their uh, their their, their wheel man uh was able to snag him street side, you know, and get away. You know, and, like this kind of thing just didn't, this kind of thing just didn't happen in you know in like in post war Germany. You know, Germany's a very orderly place. You know, that's not just a cliche. You know, um, during uh, during the struggle, um, Ulrike Meinhof, who uh, disguised herself with um, like this long like 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 wig, like one of the police who tried to grab her by the hair, like snatched his wig off, you know, revealing that she had like you know like a military style like blonde haircut. You know, and there was some confusion as to whether she was like a man or a woman too, like an initial identification. You know, so this was a very this was a crazy situation. You know. Um and um this made uh this didn't just make this didn't just make you know national headlines in the Bundes Republic, but it was something like the police weren't prepared to deal with this. I guess we'll get into the police had agents insinuated into all the major trade unions and especially for some reason, like the transportation and, and like railroad workers union was shot through with communists, like pro Warsaw Pact, you know, like Marxist Leninists. So they viewed them as their ops. Okay. Like the police did like these kinds of crazy guys who are getting like sprung out of, out of the joint, you know, by gun toting females, you know, and um, are, are 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 pulling off you know wild operations. At least, if, if to that point, not particularly organized or well thought out. You know, like they're, they're firebombing department stores and you know, sloganeering um revolutionary stuff. You know, this um they just weren't prepared for it. You know, like it was an issue of first impression, and it wasn't traditional. It wasn't traditional street volatility. Of the kind that Europe's used to, you know, like there's something very like almost kind of like American about that, you know, those kinds of those kinds of outlaw actions, you know. Um, so who who was Andreas Bader? Andreas Bader was born in 1943 in May. He was born in Munich. His father was a historian and archivist and um, like a real intellectual. Um, he'd been conscripted into Wehrmacht, you know, like, like all able-bodied men. He was taken prisoner by the, by the Russians in 45 and just was never seen again. He just never came home, you know, and Bader's mother never remarried. So Andre Bader, as a boy, he lived with his widowed mom, you know, uh, who kind of, you know, continued to pine for that someday, you know, dad was going to come home. You know, a grandmother, um, and like various, you know, aunts and uncles. But he he basically lived in this like female household without a father, you know. And there were there was millions of men who just never came home, you know, because and and hundreds of thousands where their fate was unknown, you know. They were either um they were taken prisoner and died in some gulag, you know. They they were cut to pieces. You know, a small arms fire and died in the snow. And during you know the desperate retreat, they they were their body was never recovered or identified. You know, so it's um. I'm telling you that that impacted the perspective of these boys when they became, you know, young men. You know, this like generation of fatherless boys who grew up in this authoritarian society, yet that didn't really index with them culturally. There's armed men everywhere who are there to police them, who aren't of their culture, who they can kind of relate to, 
you know, racially and linguistically, you know, at least like the white troops, you know, that this had to be an incredibly confusing situation, you know, um, and pretty much without exception, the early Bader Meinhof grouping, they, they all had some kind of background like this, you know, um, the, well, nobody, uh, nobody thinks of West Germany, what is what what was to be called West Germany, as actually being under occupation. They saw West Germany as the free democracy, Western democracy, as opposed to East Germany. Which is crazy, too, because, uh, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. You know, like, if you look at just... Um, you know, West Germany, like a, a quarter of Germany was, you know, the DDR, historical Germany. So you have West Germany, the occupation forces from 49 until um, 91 were 300,000 men, Americans. Another, there's a quarter million contingent of British, French, and Benelux troops, too. Half a million men in a country smaller than Wyoming. You know, um, armed to the teeth, you know, um, ready for war at a moment's notice. You know, and at, at Checkpoint Charlie, you know, it was, things were fairly civilized. But when you went to the true, like, inner German border, like my dad told me, and this tracks with what William Odom said and with what, you know, enlisted men who served there said, it felt like a war. You know, they were getting buzzed constantly by DDR aircraft. Um, sappers would uh, would would screw with um, the concertina wire and like probe their uh, you know the the hardness of their of their fixed defenses. This was not remotely normal, you know. And so, and on top of that, like I said, basically, you know. Germany lost uh, five and a half million men. You know, there was the country was full of like little kids, like old people and women, and and, and like nobody had a father. You know, like David Irving talked about that because he said in England it wasn't really as bad, but he's like, you know, Irving's dad didn't die, but he just kind of like went nuts and like left the family. He was like a Royal Navy vet who like couldn't adjust to civilian life, and Irving's like he went to school with a bunch of guys who had no dad. You know, um, that, that, that completely, that, that creates weird pathologies, you know, and especially the Germans, like they were, you know, um, the kind of, the kind of like soft pedaled Morgenthau plan that became their constitution. That's totally bizarre. I mean, aside from the fact, aside from like the moral aspects and aside from the fact that, you know, it's, 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 it's tailored to kind of destroy the will of people to perpetuate itself. Like, that's bizarre. You know, you're like, you're going to school and some guy or some lady is like reading off a lesson book that came from the Department of the Army, like written by some crazy Zionist, ex educating you about how like, educating you about how like, you're part of this like murderous race of people, you know, who must atone to the Jews because your history from Meister Eckhart until Adolf Hitler is about anti-Semitism. Like, that's literally insane. You know, like it, um, and, um, that kind of thing made it impossible for people to trust an authority, you know, and, uh, Germany more than most societies was, was and is one based on social capital, you know, like that, 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 that made people act really screwy, you know, and I, that, to, in my opinion, the later, Iterations of the Bader Meinhof faction are more complicated. In some ways, it's more yeah. simple, and some ways, it's more complicated. But just, just to inject this, um, my my mom would go. My my dad told me that my mom would go to East East Berlin, so she'd go through she'd go through Charlie. Yeah, and he made it sound like you know because he was a cold warrior. He made it sound like you know she was being you know she would have to do strip searches and stuff like that. No. I asked my mom, my mom's like, I had, I was treated much worse coming back into West Germany by yeah. people who looked like me and sounded like me. 
Yeah, yeah. No, I'm sure that's true. And that's because basically, have, yeah. She used to go to the museums over there. People don't realize they had amazing museums in like East Berlin. Oh yeah, and it's the it's the traditional. I mean, that was a traditional government district, among other things, too. You know, I mean, like there's a reason. There's a reason why the Soviets wanted Berlin and why East Berlin became the capital. You know, I mean, that's that was that wasn't just a mark on a map. You know, it was um or just like a prestige objective. You know, I mean, um, that's Europe Central. You know, quite literally. And yeah, it's it's an incredible place, and um, you know. But yeah, the uh, as um, apparently, uh, Bod had a reputation even as a even as a little kid as um, being highly volatile, extraordinarily strong-willed. Um, he apparently resisted all authority, sort of instinctively. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't trust these. Uh, official psychological takes on people you know in a in america or western europe that that, that declare you know oh operational defiant oppositional defiance disorder but Bader, even some of his uh even some of his comrades and like rappies basically it tracked with what they said about him and uh apparently um uh, apparently, he he came to strongly resent religious instruction. He refused to celebrate holidays. He refused to even celebrate Christmas or observe his own birthday. Um, you know, and it and and again, he, even as uh, his people who'd grown up with him were emphatic that even as a little kid, he was he was like a kid that others followed. You know, um, they uh. But as he was sprung from prison on May 14, 1970, his comrades didn't, they, did, they didn't have a plan. Like, they literally had no plan. Um, Ulrike Meinhoff, um, she, she literally had a friend who was this actress who lived a few streets away from the Central Institute of Social Research. Ulrike Meinhoff was, was an academic, you know, like a uh, like social science type. And that's where she worked. So her big, her big, her and the and the guy's big plan was, well, well, we'll go to your friend's house and demand that you know she let us, you know, like use it as a safe house until we figure out what to do, you know. Um, and I mean, they they traded shots with police, you know, one of whom was seriously injured, um, you know, which with which again, I mean, rarely, rarely happened in Germany, you know, um, then or now. Um, this friend of uh of Ulrike Meinhoff, um probably under some degree of duress, you know, they they simply rang the doorbell and said, We need your solidarity. You know, the revolution has started. Um, this poor <laughs> unsuspecting woman then got like, you know, um she was housing these fugitives and this was this was one of the biggest manhunts of of, of post war times. You know, and um, almost uh, almost everybody they were looking for was like sitting in this poor, like random lady's apartment. But um, when this really kind of becomes um, when this really kind of becomes interesting is is their their next planned move, and this this also represented the change in the ideological disposition of the of the fraction and it all, but it also, um, you know, like I said, it, it indexed with a basic German tendency towards revolutionary action that was authentically German. However, sort of couched it was in Marxist Leninist pseudoscience or, you know, gobbledygook or however much it was kind of, framed in um these like liberationist narratives of the 1960s they agreed the next move would they had to leave berlin as soon as possible obviously and they uniformly agreed they'd go to the middle east um and uh you know the palestinian resistance would 
would provide them like aid and comfort as fellow revolutionaries. Um, somehow, um, either Ulrike Minoff, um, Bader, or both, they made the acquaintance of a man named Saeed Dudin. Saeed Dudin is still alive. He he was a Jordanian emigre. He was the son of a Jordanian emigre to West Berlin. And he was a political scientist. And his father was this big shot, like, like social researcher and like regional studies expert on like Arab societies and political cultures. Saeed Dudin has never been committed, convicted of a crime. Always been hassled by the police, you know, over decades for various reasons. Um, Saeed Dudin contacted uh, his people in Jordan. He arranged tickets with uh, East German Interflug Airline, which was the DDR's national airline. He booked them nine rooms in uh, East Berlin under assumed names. And um, he arranged for people to transport them to East Berlin, you know, about three weeks subsequent. So on June 8th, 1970, um, the first group of, uh, of RAF um, operators uh, departed Schoenfeld Airport in East Berlin for um, for Palestine. Um, interestingly, and I believe this, what I'm about to describe, was all Horst Mahler. Before they departed for the Middle East, and in the immediate aftermath, I'm talking several days of uh, the prison break, an anonymous phone call was made to Michelle Ray. Um, she was a former Chanel model and, and she was a big shot, like lady journalist in French media. I'm trying to think of, um, you know, back, back, this was back in the day when you had like, you know, true like celebrity, like news people. She was a super glamorous, um, um, like, like figure, like personage. Well, Ricky Minoff undoubtedly told Horst Mahler, whoever placed this call, and I'm, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm certain it was Horst Mahler who orchestrated this about like name, like name Michelle Ray, because they they very slightly known each other from this magazine called Concret, um, which was kind of like um, it was kind of like Vanity Fair but more serious, and uh, Ulrike Meinhof, um, you know, being this kind of university type who like mingle in some high society circles. You know, she'd come across Michelle Ray and undoubtedly wreck it because like women are good at recognizing these things. She's like, look, if you want, if you want, if you want to capture cheap clout and you want like rapid uh, headlines, you know, we got to contact her because if we talk to a German journalist or whatever, they're, they're going to try and suppress this. So Michelle Ray was told that if she came to Berlin, she would get, you know, a quote, big story about like the, you know, the, the new resistance, you know, from the radical left. Um, only a combination of curiosity and maybe naivete. Um, she agreed to meet them. Uh, she arrived in Berlin a few days before the departure to Palestine on June 4th. Um, and she, she first met Andres Bader. Um, Andres Bader escorted her back to an apartment safe house where Ulrike Meinhoff himself and a woman named Gudrun Enslin lived. Gudrun Enslin was, uh, it's hard to tell because of the kind of these weren't really polyamorous hippies. Like that's what some people try to characterize it as. This is Andres Bader, like, like, like having sex with a lot of girls who he was also like doing dirt with in the street and like carrying out terrorist activities with. It's so, like Gudrun Enslin and 
and Ulriki Minoff, like they were both like his girlfriends at various times. You know, like it uh depending on what was going on. And Gudrun Enslin was very much more of like a doer. Like Gudrun Enslin, as we'll see, she kind of seems like the kind of broad who like could be your wheel man if you're like knocking over a bank. Like Ulriki Minoff was definitely down. I mean, she handled a gun to help spring Bader, but she was very much kind of like a public intellectual type who could do things like getting this French glamorous news lady to show up, okay? So it's pretty obvious, Bader, like Manson, and I'm not saying, I, I actually hold Manson in some esteem. I'm not saying this is a cast shade on Bader. He was very good at identifying certain talents in women and getting women to do things that he wanted, okay? Um, and certain kinds of men, that's like their hustle, okay? It's not just that they're horny and like girls a lot, although that's part of it. Um, women have certain skill sets. Women can kind of fly under the radar. There, that is an effective strategy depending on what you're trying to do. You know, it is. You know, that's why I tell guys not to be like down on women and talking about revolutionary conditions because that's very wrong headed. But that's kind of the way to understand it. Like it's not like I said. You you'll read these kinds of seedy uh deliberately lurid kind of uh, american or british accounts and it's they, they they present it like oh these were a bunch of hippie degenerates just having some big orgy it's not what was going on um and i think that's important to the understanding the kind of dynamic here you know um but all three of them were disguised um michelle ray had, had no idea who they were really um Apparently, she didn't even recognize Ulrike Minoff, even though they very vaguely knew each other. And most importantly, Horst Mahler was there, okay? And Mahler was the one who basically engaged her, you know? And like I said, Mahler, who remains who remained an important figure into the 21st century in dissident quarters, I believe he truly was, like, the, the, the ideologue behind this whole enterprise he was older he was a lawyer you know he was um he wasn't a hothead like botter you know he it, it just it tracks i if you you know index it with, with 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 similar groupings of people under revolutionary revolutionary conditions or conditions they believe are eminently revolutionary okay it's he, he represents a type Okay. Um, they told Michelle Ray that, you know, they kicked off the revolution, that, you know, the Buddhist Republic, the center could not hold, that, um, you know, they were leaving Berlin uh, to go to Palestine and fight as Fedeen and, and, and possibly murder themselves. You know, Michelle Ray, um, she passed a copy of the tape she made to Der Spiegel, which went nuts and blew it up, you know, and uh, the Roth Army faction overnight became this internationally known mob of dangerous terrorists, you know. Um, and of course, you know, in America, the claim was like, oh, this is this is the Ivans, like these 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 people are, you know, like KGB or GRU, you know, um, the uh the Bundes Republic was convinced that, you know, there was, there's hundreds of people in cells that were about to become active, you know, um, it, uh, like the, the, like the European secure internal security apparatus, you know, uh, like, like completely shit its pants in other words. So Mahler knew exactly what he was doing. Um, later, when asked why they'd sprung Botter from custody, Ulrike Minoff said, well, there were three reasons. She said first, quote, she said, quote, first, of course, because Andreas Botter is a, is a cadre. The Road Army fraction, they've got their own vocabulary. When they say cadre, they use the word in a singular noun and denoting a like a squad leader, you know, or like a cell commander, 
you know, or or like platoon leader, you know. And that's also why up until ninety eight, when they ceased operations, they'd always they'd always name like the action group that was engaged, you know, after either somebody who was uh, either either somebody who'd been like deceased in action or somebody who was imprisoned, you know, like from their organization. You know, um it it, it had its own culture that was kind of interesting because nobody else did that. It was very much its own thing. You know, um and their symbol was the red star with uh with a, a heckler and 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 coke um SMG, you know, not like an not a Klashnikov, not a hammer and sickle, you know, it was it's interesting. But um you know and she said second, you know, we 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 had we had she said we freed a prisoner, you know, his identity being incidental because you know the people we, we need to show people what politics is all about today. And politics politics today is about smashing the ability of the state to to impose coercive measures. Okay. And if that if that means killing policemen, you know, extreme and deranged that might sound, that people need to get habituated to that. You know, and, and you can only habituate people to that by 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 doing it over and over and over again until it becomes normal. Okay. And finally, she said, if you can free somebody from state custody, it's quite clear that you mean business and you're a serious military actor. Okay. Which, as ragtag as they were at first, that is somewhat true. Springing a man out of close custody is not a small thing. Okay. And again, that might sound kind of basic, but it's really not. It's it's sophisticated for what they were trying to do. And again, I believe that's all Horst Mahler. I'm sure he had input from the others, but um, that's exactly kind of the program he should have been pursuing, you know, for what was about a rationality of what they were trying to accomplish, you know, which was basically discredit the Buddhist Republic and in so doing, you know, create revolutionary revolutionary conditions on the ground whereby the extant structure, including its ability to wage war as a a key component of NATO is no longer possible. Okay. And when you consider it in that context, I I think my whole kind of hypothesis of, of the matter becomes a little bit more persuasive. But we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves. Um who was Ulrike Meinhoff or Ulrike Meinhoff? She was older than the rest of them. She was born in the 30s. She was born in 1934 in Oldenburg. Her dad came from a long line of Protestant theologians. And again, something you'll notice here, these kids, these people, these young people, they were basically, without exception, all from the Protestant heartland of Germany. The National Socialist heartland in Germany was the Protestant Northeast. Like, it was not, this, these, these guys like Goldhagen, who in the 90s were obsessed with claiming, like, you know, the NSDP was some, like, Catholic organization. or It was not at all. And even that aside, like, literally, the National Socialist heartland was rural and um, suburban Northeast Germany, Protestant, literally Protestant, pious Germany. Okay. And, um, especially, um, especially this first, uh, iteration, you know, this, this kind of deeply felt Protestant pietism was like an essential part of their upbringing, as well as other strange things. Now, Ulrike Meinhoff also grew up without a father, basically. Um, her father died 
when she was very young of, of pancreatic cancer. Um, her dad had been curator of the Yena Museum, which was prestigious but not well paid. Um, so when he died, uh, Ulrike's mother and um, her and her sister were in somewhat dire straits. Um, you know, she was at five and a half years old. You know, she no longer had a father in the picture. Her mother, and it's not clear, her mother took to having boarders live in the house, you know, to for money. And um, this uh, young woman from the university moved in named uh, Renata Remick. And it's not, people obviously today would, would, would speculate or that uh, Ulrike's mother and Renata Remick were, you know, were like lesbians. I don't think that's necessarily, like, necessarily the case at all. But they ended up like moving in together and like raising the girls together, you know. So, um, Enrique lived in this kind of heavily like Protestant household with no father, you know, just like her male counterparts, you know, raised by these two kind of somewhat, you know, kind but kind of dour Protestant women. Um, she she her primary school was an all girls school run by like nuns. So this is this is again this is a totally abnormal environment, you know, like an environment devoid of kind of like normal male authority figures, you know. Um, that's that's not accidental. I don't think. Um, it. Uh, Renata Reimick, after Ulrike's mom died when she was a teenager, kind of became her surrogate mom. And she she convinced Ulrike to join the Social Democrats. And at this time, Billy Brandt. Billy Brandt later became the mayor of West Berlin. And West Berlin was really kind of like a culture unto itself in all kinds of ways. You know, it wasn't like the rest of the Bundesrepublic. Republic. But Billy Brandt, he um a conciliatory posture with the east and with the soviet union was his big kind of policy coup he became consular he went down in flames his constant companion and personal assistant gunther guillaume who was a wehrmacht veteran who became a stasi agent deep cover agent gunther guillaume stole the uh nato nuclear codes from uh the secured location in um in uh in, in the Nana consular's private safe and i mean this was um the uh it, it's it was report like william odom said like we we never like we meaning military intelligence never recovered from that intelligence breach you know they're like the warsaw pack just had our number after that in terms of uh you know the uh our, our our ideas on strategic escalation and everything else you know so but billy brand at this time was like it was like a rising star you know and so renata remick and 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 young uh Ulrike minoff you know joined the social democrats and you know all all kind of like progressive people at that time you know they 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 opposed adenauer you know who who who, who the social democrats was you know uh a fascistoid um represent a fascistoid resurgence you know um Ulrike became insinuated into academe because of Renata Remick who was a professor at the Velberg Institute like educational institute okay and this was more so than America especially you know, Germans kind of like invented the public education system. You found a lot of radicals, especially female radicals, who came out of this academic culture, including Honecker's wife. Okay. 
Um, that's why, like I said, I, I think very much had uh, Ulrike, um Minel off not clicked up with Andre's botter, she probably would have been some like SPD organizer who, you know, like married some guy who was, you know, some kind of like milk toast, you know, social democrat. You know, I uh I I really believe that, you know. Um but she did have, you know, it was her uh her her it, it was it was her kind of respectability that uh allowed them to index with media you know again she was the one who identified you know michelle ray as the journalist they should seek out you know this this was an essential part of their of the propaganda aspect of the campaign um now who is gudrun enslin gudrun enslin was swabian she grew up in a village called Bartholoma, which was which was not and is not in the Protestant heartland. We talked about it a minute ago, but her father was literally a Protestant minister. Okay, her folks uh, had uh, been big in the von der Vogel movement when in like the you know the, the pre national socialist days and a little bit beyond. Um, this, this this was kind of like a naturalist movement. You know, von der Vogel means like migrating birds. Um, it was very, it was very much part of like the folkish culture. Okay. Um, in 1958, Gudrun visited the USA where she learned to speak English. She was an exchange student for a year. She stayed in Pennsylvania with this Methodist community and she liked the Americans and they liked her, but she reported back to her friends and like her you know her swabian village and her parents that like well you know the the americans aren't pious enough you know they they um they're, they're, there's something superficial about you know like the way the way they're practicing protestantism in eisenhower's america you know um she had that kind of like radical pietist perspective you know that i think indexed with national socialism in a basic way. Um, when she came back, she started studying English language and uh, German educational theory, but she quickly, but she quickly uh, lost interest in that when she met the son of uh the Ville Vesper. Bill Vesper was a folkish poet and a dedicated national socialist. Okay. Um and his son was very much in that vein. You know, and he was this kind of like passionate wild guy who was like a poet himself. And um he traveled to Spain a lot because in those days obviously Spain was friendly to people like him and his father. Okay. Um Gudrun's parents were upset by the kind of passion they saw with this kind of like wild guy. And her father was prone to throw him out of the house when he'd catch him there. They were mollified when um, the couple uh, got married. But, um, you know, it uh, again, this, uh, this uh, Bernwald Vesper was the son of Ville. Apparently, the father and the son, um, there was there was huge tension between them beyond the kind of ordinary, you know, um, difficulties between fathers and sons. But nevertheless, again, um, you know, he was still marinated in that blood and soil ethos, and he was making regular pilgrimage to Spain. You know, this this is the fir the first trip he took her on was to Spain, and I mean, even if even if in a critical capacity, you know, the son Bern Bernward was a uh, was kind of like rejecting, you know, like the faith of the father. 
I mean, you can't you can't truly like escape like your your, your heritage theologically or politically. Okay, so this young one's first love, which was this incredibly passionate affair was with the son of a national socialist poet who himself wrote like blood and soil poetry and took her to Franco Spain. You know, I mean, I, I can't believe that Gudrun Elson simply like shed all sensibilities of that, you know, and, um, and, and, and spent the remainder of her life, you know, like staying up late reading communist manifesto with her new comrades, you know, or Das Kapital perhaps. But that, um, and like I said, she, by the time she'd, uh, by the time she'd connected up with her World Army Fraction comrade, she'd become kind of, uh, she, she was kind of drifting in life. But that, um, that was basically the core of, uh, the first iteration of um the Rote Army Fraction. And for context, you know to distinguish too kind of like the German youth movement from you know kind of the American SDS movement and liberty nature. You know, Germany was not a free society. Adnar's successor as consular was Ludwig Erhard. Um, Ludwig Erhard, he basically banned the public, um, the, the, like, the, like the playing of music publicly, unless it was like an uh, officially sanctioned performance. Like the reasoning being, you know, stuff that stirs the passions, whether it's art or music or any, any kind of evocative things that can easily be transposed into, into nationalist sentiments. And this will be a return to Weimar. So kids uh, who'd convene for spontaneous music festivals or even guys just plugging into an amp and, you know, while wanting to play uh, a kind of spontaneous set in their college courtyard, they'd literally be broken up by the police, you know, and told to cease and desist. Um, in the summer of 62, um, this, this, this became historically known as, as the Schwabing Riots. Okay, and then referring to the Schwabing district, where most of these, you know, disturbing the peace incidents were, you know, kind of most enforced in the most kind of heavy handed way, technically speaking. You know, so it's not, I, I want to disabuse people with this idea again that these, these were like SDS hippie kids who were kind of the same, cut from the same cloth as like non draft dodgers or. Like, you know, fools following Eddie Hoffman and having like a chip on their shoulder about shit. Like it wasn't like that. You know, um, I probably got more um I probably got somebody for the double in, in a way that many people don't. But I I think this is important, not because of my own feelings on the matter or private passions, but I mean because the historical record in this regard is not it's not um it's not correct um i don't uh i don't mean to be abrupt but i gotta i'm in a lot of pain right now if we could pick this up um if we could pick this up uh with a, a final episode i can go for 90 minutes or so and wrap it up sure sure uh, okay um, yeah 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 absolutely um knock out a couple plugs and we'll get out of here yeah for sure man um I'm uh I'm busily updating my sub stack and um we're well into season two of the pod. You can find both um at real Thomas seven 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 number seven HMAS seven 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 dot substack dot com. Um I'm on uh Instagram, I'm on uh I'm on Tgram. I remain on Twitter. Um, there's still some productive discussion there, I believe, or I wouldn't still be there. And a way to poach new um, contacts. Um, I'm at uh, capital R E A L underscore number seven H O M A S seven seven seven. It's the real Thomas. 
Um, and yeah, I'm uh, I'm busily uh, trying to get this manuscript banged out um, by uh, by fall. And uh, that's where I'm at. And again, forgive me if I ended this abruptly. Um, that was no not problem. my intent. Okay. And and uh, head over to my website where I have a page that's dedicated just to Thomas and my movie reviews and links to all of it. And um, we'll probably have to talk about setting up the next one. So, yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. Mystery Science Theater. Yeah. So I've, <laughs> I've been very much enjoying it, man. And we've been, we've been getting a lot of like really great feedback from people. That makes me feel good. Yeah. All right, Thomas. Thank you. Yeah, man.